Tonight, author and comedy writer Zarka Nawaz and I talk Little Mosque's big success, her very funny new novel Jamila Green Ruins Everything, and why she was grateful for Donald Trump. Sort of. It'll make sense in context. It's up all night with Bob. Stay, like, subscribe. Woo! Folks, among a long list of accomplishments, my guest tonight was the creator of Little Mosque on the Prairie, the popular and at times controversial Canadian sitcom, which aired from 2007 to 2012 and can now be enjoyed in the U.S. on both Tubi TV and Prime Video from Amazon. She is a public speaker, a journalist, and her first and very funny novel, Jamila Green Ruins Everything, is about to be published on May 10th by Simon & Schuster in Canada and Harper in the U.S. Please welcome my dear friend and colleague, Zarka Nawaz, how are you, man? I am great. How are you, Bob? I am delightful. It is lovely to see your face. I, you, you and I get to chat on the phone periodically. I, we, we were initially going to speak a, a couple of weeks ago, but of course it was, it was Ramadan. Um, explain to a dummy like me, so Eid moves around because the, the Islamic <laughs> calendar is, is 10 months. Is that correct? No, it's a lunar calendar. So compared to a solar calendar, the days move up by about roughly 10 to 11 days every year. Okay. So it takes like, I think a 35 year cycle for the lunar calendar to go to the same date um, and the, as the solar calendar. So it's a little shorter, I guess. I don't know. Cause the months are exactly 30, 29, 30 days. Right. I don't know. I don't know the technical issues. All I know is that we, it screws up the whole world because none of us know what day Ramadan begins. <laughs> <laughs> so the first i was uh i was on the staff at little mosque uh just to explain the connection to people who wouldn't know uh which is nobody um and so in 2007 and 2008 and in 2007 uh with the holiday season with the with the christmas holiday season coming uh we figured out and tell me if i'm wrong but at that year eid and christmas were falling around the same time does that make sense yeah it did fall on the same i think within days of each other Right. And so we thought it to, we decided to do a show about the stresses when you have two holidays in one building. <laughs> yeah, the, the premise of the show was that the mosque, because this was a small prairie town, the mosque was in the was in the basement of the church. So if Eid and and Christmas were to fall at the same time, yeah, there was a a geography issue there. Tomorrow, <laughs> I may not get the turnout I used to get, but I can pack them in for the holidays. You're just going to have to reschedule your thingy look it's not a thingy it's Eid al adha the islamic festival of sacrifice it's a tradition that stretches over a thousand years well can you change it it's on the same night as ring ding a sing along yeah, it was a great show we had so much fun making that show rock we did one of the kind of amazing fun things about that was you were able to kind of you were such a font of, of, of ideas and situations that we never would have been able to, well, A, that we wouldn't have been able to do on other shows just because of the, the nature, obviously, of the subject matter. But like, I can remember talking about, we, at the time that I was there, there was sort of a romance going on between Rayanne and uh, I think JJ, which is a character that we brought in a second or third year. And we had this idea about what their first date was going to be like. And we brought it to you. And you, for you, the first thing you said was, uh, well, they can't be on a date without a chaperone. And so, the, well, it's got to be Babber because Babber is kind of a pain in the butt. So we'll make Babber go out with that. But that, that was the beauty of that show was that you kind of started with a premise that you could do on any show, which was let's get the young couple out on their first date. And then what's the sort of, I won't say Islamic angle, because the angle wasn't necessarily an Islamic angle, but the, the angle of these characters in this place at this time. It's so interesting because I feel that it grew so much year to year. Like bringing in JJ was such a blessing because that, that opened up a whole new storyline of um, romance and dating and, and jealousy with Amar and you know, that relationship. It just changed the whole tenor of the show. I think it got deeper and richer with every season and got more layered. And there were so many things that we did. I mean, I wish we had done more, say, with Fatima and Fred Tupper. I felt like that was an opportunity that I wish right. we had a chance to explore more because there was that latent romance between those two, which I don't think I really understood. That was my first television show. I, so I, and nobody really had a sense of it, I think because it was so, the concept of Muslims in a mosque, running a mosque, like what, 
what is this? And we none right. of us could fall back, fall back on anything because there was nothing in the world like it. It's actually it's funny what you say about because the, there were there were so many great people kind of populating the the perimeter of that cast. You just mentioned them. The guy who played Fred Tupper, uh, Neil Crone, who's very funny, and Fatima was uh, Arlene um, uh, Arlene Duncan. Arlene Duncan, yeah, a tremendous actor, and uh, and just a lot of yeah. There were a lot of really fun ways to kind of mix those people up. And those were the days when you would only. I think we roughly shot. We had half of the script done in the hopper by the time we got to production. Is because a lot of people now write them all and then they shoot right yeah which is which you know is a, was a very canadian thing i think based on a shorter orders because a lot of shows were getting ordered for six or eight episodes and also because if you had a really low episode order you could block shoot which is what often happened you would often block shoot four or five I think I, I think I worked on one where it was like five or six episodes all at once. So it was like, okay, well, let's shoot out all of our scenes in this location, all of our scenes, which was a huge, here's the problem. The problem with that is, as you, you, you know, is that the more that you have at the outset, the less you're able to adapt later on. So if you discover, let's say, for instance, that Arlene and Neil have a real chemistry as Fatima and, and um, Fred Tupper, it's too late to kind of, build that into a storyline because you're you know you're already there and also because you're dealing with a small staff i think we had maybe maybe a half a dozen people in that room what do you think yeah it ranged from seven to maybe nine at the maximum let me ask you this and i it, uh, this will sound like a brave question but if i come out badly in the answer i, I i'll just cut it out but <laughs> i'm curious to find out like you know, there's been so much talk about diversity and representation, both in front of the camera and behind the camera in the years since. This was 2007, 2008. Those things weren't necessarily as top of mind, but we were also aware, particularly me and you know, the, the white guy coming into the to the operation, um, that we needed to have that authenticity of voice. What was your what was your overall scorecard there? I, you know, I, you, you, you can feel free to hurt my feelings. Yeah, I mean, it was like every year was so different, Rob, because it was a new showrunner and a new, almost sometimes right. a new set of writers. And I mean, my favorite year was with you when you were the showrunner, because I felt like we all That's came really together. Yeah, well, it was true, though. I felt like you heard me. I was supported. We came together. We gelled well. And, you know, but there were so, but then the next year you were, I think, gone and there were someone else. And I think the sense I was getting from the CBC or the production team was that they were never going to let me be the showrunner. They were never going to train me up and let me take the helm. I, but I've got to stay because how can they do this without me? Uh, and I wasn't sure why there was this sense of, you know, we're going to hire this other person and give this person the power. And, and then I was, depending on who it was and what my relationship with that person was, if it was good, like with you, then things were great for me. If that person didn't like me or felt threatened by me, then it was then I had to be more careful. Right. And I figured that out really quickly um, that I was never going to be the person who would eventually run the show. And then I remember someone had said to me, listen, the politics of this room are really, really crazy. The best thing for you to do is just keep your head down and learn the craft of writing because right. you either can get really upset about how things are working out or you can just learn the crack so that when your time comes, you'll know how to write and run a room because you spent the time learning and not the time trying to battle all these, you know, fights that were around me. A lot of, you know, people gunning for recognition and power and the machinations in that place were just nuts. Yeah, success has many uh, fathers and uh, failure is an orphan, isn't that how the expression goes? Yeah, it, it, it is. It's funny. Just looking back, though, thinking back to the very beginning, because it's almost easy to forget now. It seems less controversial, I think, now than maybe it did in 2007. This is only five years after 9-11, and, and people are still tense, aren't they? And I think that, that's, <laughs> been, that's been borne out. I mean, a lot of these clips, I think, are still circulating online. I, I, I hope I can maybe find one. I can just put up a, a couple seconds. But you were talking to, tell us who you were talking to. You were Glenn talking Beck, to remember him? <laughs> Oh my God, Glenn Beck, the sort of um, yeah. slightly more watery version of Tucker Carlson of his day. What, uh, and still around, yeah. unfortunately. Like I, when I was first told I was going to be interviewed by Glenn Beck, I, I don't know why, I had never heard of the guy. Right. I was just thinking like, you know, something, someone nice and warm and squishy. And then one of the writers looked him up and said, oh my God, you are, you are in so much trouble. <laughs> and it was too late. 
Oh man. So there was nobody kind of, you didn't have kind of a media prep person who was sort of helping you kind of ramp up to some of this attention. No, they just sort of threw me. It was so interesting, right? Given how, like my husband reminds me of this, like they literally threw me out and everyone was one, you know, single, single um, line behind me and said, she will be the face. And, and then what, then when it became, super popular it was yeah. kind of like get out of the way yeah like, oh you know <laughs> then i was like okay what what <laughs> yeah try finding a chair at the symposium after that right everybody's yeah on stage it was so and... funny let's talk about the book jamila green ruins everything really funny uh uh tell me i i read the book a couple of weeks ago i you you must have your pitch together what give give us your log line <laughs> tell us what's your what's jamila, the book about jamila green is a story about a bitter vindictive you know, Muslim writer who is disappointed that she's, you know, experiencing all these professional failures and she's having a really hard time connecting with her faith, her family, her community. And she meets an imam and says that, you know, God owes her because she believes in God and belongs to religion and prays all the time. And all these white people who don't even believe in God get all the success. What's up with that? And so she demands from the imam that he coerced God to give her what she wants. And he, of course, is appalled by her really shallow and narcissistic behavior and says maybe if she would stop, you know, navel gazing so much and actually went out and did something good for the world, um, God might be more inclined to give her what she wants. And hence starts a very long series of unfortunate events for Jamila where she comes around and rediscovers, you know, her faith and her relationship with her family and community. And ultimately at the same time, eventually winds up it's not isis in the book it, <laughs> it's named dick a, yes a very subtle <laughs> very subtle and 2014 is when i started writing the book and you know i had been disappointed that my memoir that i had published the book came out and i and i thought it was going to go to the new york times bestseller list and it didn't and so i was kind of feeling this strong sense of professional failure and disappointment and so I was kind of in like kind of the, 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 you know, really despair kind of sense, sensibility. And that's when I started writing the book. And it was about Jamila talking to God going, you know, how come everybody else is so famous and successful and I'm not, and I've done all the right things. And, and so I started writing her journey, which was very much my journey. And then ISIS had sort of emerged in the headlines and I was like, yeah. oh my God, oh my God. It's like Muslims are forever fighting the PR war. And this is like the worst, the worst thing. <laughs> and everyone Bad was PR. like, oh yeah, like, well, how are we gonna survive this? And you know, everyone was like, well, political pundits were saying Muslims, you know, this is what they do. They naturally become, if you leave them to their own devices, they'll eventually join a violent jihadi radical group and try to kill everyone, <laughs> right? And I was like, no, 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 like there's gotta be more to this, like even Bill Maher, he, I remember him saying on his show of the 1.6 billion Muslims in the world, every single one of them has some sort of interstitial tissue association with this group and its savage practices. And I was like, oh, come on. Right. So it was so crazy, the stuff that was coming out in the media. And I just felt like there was more to this group that we didn't understand at the time. So I started reading all the newspaper articles because there weren't even books to read. No one understood it. But the more I started reading and the more research that I did, and I started reading other books, um, I read The Extraordinary Journey of the Fakir Who Got Trapped in Ikea Wardrobe. And there was a single line in that book about how the American provisional coalition government in Iraq had screwed things up so badly that they had created a power vacuum for the men who would eventually create ISIS to form. And I was like, oh, that's so interesting. And then I started doing more research and then gradually, um, Jamila, when she goes to the imam and she asks him for help, he acts that he gets he disappears the same way Mahar Arar was disappeared in Canada, mm -hmm. like like someone who just started, like one day you go to the police and gone and and everyone's like well he must have been a terrorist and she knew that it was her fault and that she had caused this um, problem and she had to try to save him and by saving him she accidentally gets embroiled with this group called the Dominion of the Islamic Caliphate and kingdom which was dick <laughs> right <laughs> and i really wanted to name them that and the original title of the book was the rise and fall of dick which my oh. children loved loved, yeah, I got, loved. I, i'm with your children on that one but the publishers closer you know they allowed me to um have that for a long time and finally they were like yeah no <laughs> <laughs> no you gotta well, change you, it you do get into some of the geo 
politics of the situation and the fact that during you know the afghani afghanistan war uh, uh, with russia in 1988 that the us were essentially arming and funding and creating some of these characters right i mean osama bin laden yeah he was a, a creation of the cia and many like i was reading M- M- the mahmoud mamdani's book good muslim bad muslim and he said you know there hadn't been an armed jihad in the muslim world for like a century until the cia was like you know, there's all these Muslims, like a billion Muslims. We have an untapped army. And they went out on this incredible recruiting process, trying to convince Muslims that this was their jihad. And he says, in many ways, this was an American jihad because they needed, they did everything they could to encourage young men from all over the world to go to Afghanistan and fight. But when the yeah. war was over, those men, some of them who were nuts, needed a cause. And then they found it throughout the yes. world. Bill Maher aside, I wonder if 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 the community at all feels the pressure off because, in some ways, you know, it's interesting. It's like it's like growing up in the '90s. Whatever was going on geopolitically, it was like, well, at least the Cold War is over. At least we're not worried about getting, you know, nuked all the time. And in the 2000s, it was like, okay, this is our worry now. We're gonna get someone's gonna fly a plane into every building, and we're all gonna die. And the big bad, you know. Uh, Islamic terrorists are going to get us. Now, I almost look back on the 2000s with the same vague sense of nostalgia that I look back on the Cold War, which is that, at least in terms of the media, we knew who the enemy was, and they were there, and they were out there, and they looked like that. There's so much domestic homegrown terrorism. There's so much domestic homegrown extremism. Does that, has there been any trickle down of... (laughs) Do you feel like sort of like some of the weight is off of the Muslim community or is it just as bad as ever? Because most people obviously will always be blind to whatever you want to call it, white terrorism, essentially. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I wrote an article for um, the Globe and Mail about this exact subject. And I said, after Trump was elected, I felt like our brown fairy godmother had sort of waved her wand and said, your time is over <laughs> <laughs> in the headlines. Someone else is replacing you because for the, then the not, once the Nazis and the KKK and the proud boys, and the right, the white terrorists and the white nationalists started coming yeah. up. I know everyone was really upset with Trump, but I was like, yes, yes. <laughs> right? I'm, he, I'm gave me, he gave me the greatest gift a Muslim could hope for, which is like, the media immediately stopped looking at ISIS day and night for headlines and started suddenly their gaze like creakily moved slowly going, Hey, what is happening? Where did all these people come from? What, you know? And I was like, they have been here all along. <laughs> and yes. because you've ignored them, you've empowered them at your peril. And now you are paying the price. And once the, the Capitol Hill riots happened and the trucker convoy hit Ottawa, it was the first time I started hearing reporters refer to white people as terrorists. When the when the Muslim the the infamous Muslim ban in uh, in early 2017 um, was was proposed and enacted by uh, the Trump administration, um, that in general public opinion was pretty quickly and pretty swiftly, and I think fairly loudly, no, this is dumb, wrong, stupid. You can't do this. It's also so it's unconstitutional for mainly, but. Did you feel, or do you, or do you, or am I being Pollyannish about that? That that public opinion was maybe more um, ambivalent than I'm giving it credit. I think it was incredible that people were rushing to the airports to help. Muslims lawyers were saying, "We are, we will come and we will help you," and they rushed there with their laptops, saying, "You know, I don't know what lawyers would do in a situation like that." But they all came rushing, and there were people protesting at airports. I mean, it was so heartwarming to see that people could realize that this was so racist and so anti-Muslim and so blatantly unfair. Like, I thought that was incredible that that outpouring of support was, in, you know, it was so amazing to see. It is now time to play our favorite game show, 20-ish questions. 20-ish questions with Zarka Nawaz. Are you ready? We'll put the clock up. There's no clock. Number one, when spelling your name aloud to an American, do you use say Z or Z? Oh, always Z, because if you say Z, they'll, they just stop and they don't know what's going on. You recently posted a photo of some very delicious looking samosas after Ramadan. <laughs> uh, what goes into Zarka Nawaz's samosas? You know, I actually tried to delete that afterwards because it was so poorly lit, but I couldn't. And then uh, the likes started coming. Oh. <laughs> it was too late. I know that. I, was, I, I, was I know that. Oh my God. I'm like, oh, it's too late. Um, 
I like beef samosas the most. I watched, like, I know it sounds crazy, but a lot of us have learned our own heritage and culture by watching YouTube videos. I watched this video with, I think she was Somali. I don't even know because her head wasn't there. And no music, just her hands. You just saw her hands make the, the wrappers, the dough and how to do it. And I, I, watched, I watched it like 200 times and learned how to do it from this woman who taught me how to make it. Oh, that's time. amazing. Yeah. So th- those of us who have learned our heritage from YouTube, it's really shocking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, published novelist now, favorite novelist that isn't you. My God, I you know what? I This is a terrible thing to say, but I listen to audio books because it's faster and easier. And yeah, I, have insom- I, I, I have insomnia and they put me to bed. So let's see. The one that I am listening to right now is so good. I really recommend this author. It is Richard Osman, and I'm reading his second book, The Man Who Died Twice. Uh, number four, you were born in Liverpool in 1967. <laughs> Which classic Beatles album was released last <laughs> summer? I, I don't know anything about the Beatles. Not a Beatles fan. That's, <laughs> I thought, well, you know, maybe you were born in Liverpool. You're, were, you, were your parents a Beatles fan? I mean, I know that, you know, it's the only thing. No, I'm what happened was my father was a civil engineer, and he was working on the ma- the tunnel, the Massey tunnels, some sort of tunnel oh, okay. in, in Liverpool. And he was, uh, so that's why they had hired a lot of Pakistani engineers in Liverpool because they needed concrete civil engineers. Oh, that's interesting. Um, it was Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Oh, okay, good. 1967, the summer of love. Um, here's one. A creator slash writer slash performer slash filmmaker could be anything of Islamic origin working today that you wish were better known. I wish, I hope that Nida Manzoor gets well known. She is the creator of the show, We Are Lady Parts. Have you heard of this show? No, I haven't. It's it's, uh, NBC is streaming it. It came out of BBC. It is about a Muslim women's punk rock band. (laughs) And they have have a Muslim woman in niqab who's the band manager who smokes a lot of weed. (laughs) It came out of the BBC uh peacock nbc it's on their streaming service uh number eight we're jumping around sheila mccarthy who played yasser's yes. wife sarah on little mosque we often have a diehard question in here by the way <laughs> that's okay <laughs> sheila mccarthy who played yasser's wife sarah on little mosque featured prominently in one of the diehard sequels do you know which one it was I'm it wasn't the first one questions. it wasn't the first it one was not the first one <laughs> That much I know because I just saw that recently with yeah. my family. The second one? <laughs> it was the second one. Die Hard 2, Die Harder, featuring Die Hard. a, uh, a delightful uh, Sheila McCarthy. Uh, what was your favorite toy as a little girl? I liked the Easy Bake Oven. Oh, my sister had one of those. I liked it too. That was so much fun. Yeah. Show you wish you had created. <laughs> the one you just mentioned. Oh yeah, that's amazing. We are lady parts. I love that show. I lo- have you ever seen My Brilliant Friend on no. HBO? Oh, so amazing. It's about it's Italian and it's about these two little girls uh, in Italy, like who grew up in Naples, a really poor village, and 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 as they grow up, how their story evolves. It's just and it's based on a series of novels. It's amazing. Oh, oh amazing. Neat. Okay, well, good. Some good recommendations today. This is good. Uh, you get the first move in tic tac toe. Are you going circle or X? And where is it going? It's going forward. <laughs> I don't know. No, but on the grid. So, you know, the little grid, like, are you a middle? Are you, are you go straight at the middle first person or do you start in a corner or what's your, what's your move? I think I would start in the corner. It's more tricky, more tricky. No okay, one knows you, what's happening. I know. I agree. I'm a, I, I have been a lifelong X in the middle guy and it, it too often goes awry. Um, what is your most prized worldly possession? Just a thing. I know it, it keeps changing, right? I would say, I now have to say reading glasses because I can't see anymore. <laughs> like, is that a new I have thing? a string. Yeah, I have a string around my. Um, I see that. I like. Are you like? What what happens with you? Do you wear glasses? Well, I do, and I. The only reason I don't have them on now is because they. I have never been able to figure out. I haven't quite been able to sort out not having them reflect in the light. So then you know it. It just has that little block. Best memory of childhood. We had this ball like it was in england i don't know if you remember it was like a giant rubber ball with like what looked like two ears 
and you would sit on it oh, and you'd yes, bounce. I do do you remember those. that? I didn't have one, but my friend did. And I, I yeah, absolutely do. I, absolutely I loved do. it to death. And it was, I loved it so much. And my parents, when we moved, immigrated from England to Toronto, like I kept saying, I, we can't leave that ball. And I don't think my parents understood how much I loved the ball. And my father's like, you know, I have a brand new red car. You're going to love it. And he showed me the car. And I remember just looking at it going, but it's not my ball. <laughs> <laughs> and just being really upset like that's the only thing i remember about immigrating to canada is like not being able to take that ball with me not, not, and not being Im- yeah and t- not being able to explain to my parents how important that ball was. <laughs> i i mean i completely get it the, i i uh, and also i remember the toy you're talking about it was quite a thick uh rubber yes. and i i think they sort of fell out of fashion because from what i remember bouncing around on one invariably you topple over <laughs> fall on the floor and break your arm but um yeah isn't that funny those things you get attached to those little you know nothings it's like if you had it it would never mean as much if you had it again it would never mean as much to you as not having it yeah you know know what i mean when i was a kid my mother would not submit to purchasing a stretch armstrong do you remember (laughs) yeah yeah go inside to her for some reason that one she just drew the line with that one she was like it was 20 bucks which was a lot of money at the time she's like i'm not spending 20 dollars so years three or four years ago they they put out the original design again and i couldn't be more excited i see it in the store and i'm like oh my gosh the original stretch armstrong is back and now because i'm a big time and i can afford 20 bucks on my own uh i i i brought it home and played with it once and it went in the drawer and i never (laughs) your mother was right she was also before we go i just want to point out a uh uh, uh something very nice that happened that you posted about yesterday shondaland i know oh my god tell Shonda us about Land. this you're, the, you're, you're topping the list of the of the may books on shondaland yeah i guess the person who curates that list you know read the book loved the book she had tweeted me when i asked her i go how did i make this list? She goes, oh when i got it i loved it and i was just waiting for may so i could put you on the list oh, that's because I was, just, I, I was on tw- twitter and i was like shondaland <laughs> like she just included me on her top, you know, top five books of May. And I, she's a very big deal and a woman of color and Bridgerton and all the things that she's done for television. And the woman is historic when it comes to representation. Like Absolutely. she's like, oh, gee. So I was so thrilled that it was her. Yeah, I'm, I'm thrilled for you. I hope that I hope that translates into some uh, big sales for you because you deserve it. Guess what? That's it. We're done. Zarka Nawaz, you have been a guest on Up All Night with Bob. How was it? It was great. Zarka Nawaz is wrapped. Good night, Zarka. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on.